good morning, good afternoon, uh, and dare I say good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here this morning or afternoon. Uh, my name is Dale Loon, and I'm the America's editor for Natural Gas World, and I'd like to thank you for joining this webinar, which is the first in a series leading up to our Canadian Gas Dialogues Conference, which for the first time since 2019 will be a live in-person event, September 29th at the Calgary Petroleum Club. I hope you can all make it. Go to naturalgasworld.com and you'll find details on registering. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Bayotech, for bringing you this, web with this webinar. Bayotech is a leading provider of modular, scalable, and rapidly deployable hydrogen production systems. Bayotech makes hydrogen easy. Uh, this webinar is also a part of our new and expanded Canadian Gas Dialogues platform, which includes the conference in September, and as I mentioned, a series of webinars and other engagements that we'll be doing throughout the year. Uh, you can also go to naturalgasworld.com and join our Canadian Gas Dialogues platform. It's kind of like the Patreon uh, platform if you're uh, familiar with that on the IT side. Uh, we're here to talk about hydrogen today. Joining us are a couple of people that I'm sure you're probably quite familiar, familiar with, uh, Dr. David Lazell is the Energy Systems Architect and Research Director with the Transition Accelerator here in Alberta. And he's quickly becoming the go-to guy on anything to do with hydrogen. And also joining us is Greg Caldwell. He's the second go-to guy on hydrogen. He's the utility, or the Director of Utility Hydrogen Strategy at Alberta Gas Distributor, ATCO. Um, and together we'll be discussing the opportunities and challenges of hydrogen uh, in meeting Canada's energy transition aspirations, which as you all know, uh, is net zero by 2050. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to say that I'm coming to you today from my home office just outside Calgary on the traditional territories that I'm honored to share as a guest of the Blackfoot Confederacy, that inc includes the Siksika, Kainai, and Pekini First Nations, the Tutina and Nakoda Nations, uh, Region 3, Métis Nation, and all Indigenous people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. As an introduction, let me put Do Not Disturb so I don't get those crazy little dings every time I get an email. Um, unless you've been li living under a rock or in a cave somewhere, uh, you'll know that hydrogen has rapidly risen uh, in the lexicon of the energy transition globally. Uh, it has become almost what some people might consider a silver bullet to net zero by 2050. I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't believe any of our guests or any of you well-informed viewers out there agree with that, but it is uh, becoming in political conversations, in NGO conversations, kind of the, uh, the way to go to get to carbon neutrality in the next 30 years. Uh, as you also know, there's a, a variety of hues in the hydrogen spectrum from gray all the way through to green, uh, turquoise, blue, uh, and probably a few other colors in there too. Uh, and Canada, as you also probably know, is a, it's a major producer of hydrogen. I believe I saw once somewhere it was 10th uh, largest in the uh, world in terms of hydrogen production, and right now all of it's gray. Uh, green hydrogen is a, is growing in Canada, mostly in in Quebec, where they have a massive hydroelectric potential to produce green green hydrogen. And blue hydrogen, which is currently much cheaper than green, is a growing presence in Western Canada. Uh, 
Western Canada has always been a major gray hydrogen producer. A lot of the petrochemical industries and refining industries use it in their in their process systems. Um, so everyone out here is familiar with what gray hydrogen is, and there's also a growing carbon capture and sequestration uh, presence in Western Canada, which lends uh, hydrogen its blue hue. Uh, in fact, there, there really are not too many physical restrictions to the creation of blue hydrogen in Western Canada. Uh, the Canada Energy Regulator has already estimated that Western Canada has uh, the potential to store, let me see my notes, up to 650 billion metric tons of CO2 in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And here in Alberta, two major CCS projects, Shell's Quest project, which is now uh, in Canadian Natural Resources Limited's portfolio, and the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line uh, have sequestered more than 6 million metric tons of CO2. And to put a, an end note to that conversation just this morning, TC Energy and Pemina Pipelines, a couple of major energy infrastructure uh, companies in Western Canada have announced plans for a multi-billion dollar investment to develop the Alberta carbon grid, which they say could ultimately capture up to 2 trillion metric tons of CO2. Uh, saw it in, in a basal sands formation northwest of Edmonton, uh, and that equates to about 20 million metric tons a year of CO2 capture and stored. So there's lots of running room in Alberta for the production of blue hydrogen, and we'll talk today about what that means, uh, the challenges of utilizing that running room and the potential for hydrogen to be a key component of, of Canada's net zero aspirations. Um, so let's start, first of all, with a view from 30,000 feet. And, and I'm going to ask David this question. Uh, the federal government released its hydrogen strategy, I believe, last December. Can you give us a, an elevator pitch on what that hydrogen says, what it hopes to achieve? Uh, certainly, I'd, I'd love to. The, um, of course, it's part of Canada's uh, goal or, or strategy to get to net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, and the, I think anybody looking at the nature of our energy systems around the world today recognizes that if we're going to get to net zero, we need to start using a lot more uh, zero emission energy carriers, uh, like electricity made without uh, carbon emissions or with very low carbon emissions or uh, chemical energy carriers uh, to replace uh, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, even natural gas, uh, so, so that when they are combusted, they don't release carbon emissions. And we need to actually make those energy, the energy carriers without carbon emissions as well, or with very low carbon emissions. And so hydrogen has been identified as uh, one of the, uh, probably one of the only really credible uh, zero emission energy carriers that could really support the energy systems for the world's economies into the future and, uh, and in a net zero world. And so the Canadian hydrogen strategy was put together um, uh, after I've been working on it. I guess the government of Canada has been working on it for a couple of years now, and it came out in December. And it talks about a pretty aggressive uh, uh, strategy to get the high, large amounts of hydrogen. One of the things uh, it's looking at is perhaps as much as 30% of secondary energy use in the country would be um, coming from hydrogen. That amounts to about... 20 million tons of hydrogen per year. Put that in perspective. Um, there's a the all of the hydrogen produced in Canada today is about 8 million tons. So and it's used as an industrial feedstock. We'd be talking about another 20 million tons that would be um, used as a fuel essentially to drive uh, vehicles, uh, to heat homes, uh, to make steel, and to replace some of the existing energy carriers we have today. Some of the metrics on the Canadian strategy, uh, the, they've identified that, uh, you know, perhaps 5 million fuel cell electric vehicles on the road. We have to put that in perspective. There are about 25 million vehicles on the road today. Um, and the 5 million, a lot of those would be the heavy duty ones. Uh, big trucks, trains, are, of course, they're not on the road, but trains as well. These are, are vehicles that use a lot of fuel. 
uh, and also hydrogen being used in ferries and in, in ships, uh, et cetera, and off-road vehicles. A uh, lot of hydrogen they're looking at is up to 50% of hydrogen in natural gas. And uh, big fueling networks, um, $50 billion a year is estimated as the economic potential domestically, and then maybe another $50 billion a year for export because Canada's probably got some of the cheapest, is able to make hydrogen, either blue hydrogen, as you've talked about, from natural gas or from carbon sources, and green hydrogen from renewables, or uh, et cetera. We're, we're one of the cheapest places in the world to make hydrogen. So that, that's kind of what's behind the, the Canadian strategy. And I guess I guess the, the major question everyone wants to know is is all of that achievable, given the current <laughs> policies of the federal government, uh, and I guess more importantly the the cost of it all. Well, it's it's interesting. I I think that uh, whether it's achievable, certainly we have to start now in earnest in order to grow, and it's going to be as most transitions they occur very slow at the start and then they gain speed and there's a large transition and then they, you know, to, to, in order to achieve it, it's kind of an S curve type of, of transformation because there's a lot of stock and infrastructure that has to be changed over. To do it in 30 years is a very major um, S, you know, challenge. One of the things we know about hydrogen is that um, we can make it at a lower cost than for example, diesel fuel. We can make hydrogen about half to a little bit, you know, 60% of the cost of wholesale cost of diesel. Um, the big problem with hydrogen is it's really difficult to move around and to store compared to diesel fuel. And so what you make up for and be able to make the, you know, from blue hydrogen, we could make it a lower cost than wholesale cost of diesel. The, the challenge is, is how to get it distributed. Um, uh, pipeline distribution is going to be very important in an economically viable system in the future and and how to store it and essentially you know it's it's learning a lot from our exit natural gas energy system and piggyback on some of that infrastructure uh, and and Greg knows a lot about this and and he can talk about some of the things that that uh, he's been thinking about in this space but you know if we're going to do it uh, I think one of the main messages that we have is go big or go home. We can't do it just a little bit here and a little bit there. We got to get to scale and we got to get to a, a level of scale where the economic viability comes in. And and so it's going to be expensive for the first few years until we get to it's a number of years until we get to scale. But uh, I think by 2028, 20, 2030, 20, we could be seeing economically viable systems in Canada, but it's going to uh, it's going to require some significant investment and some policy changes. So not not one of the um, phantom or or pipe dream technologies that the IEA would like to see uh, brought in to to get their uh, net zero roadmap in everybody's psyche, but doable, but still a challenge. Okay, uh, Greg, maybe you can talk to us about. Uh, Alberta's natural gas vision, uh, I believe, ahead of the hydrogen strategy last year, the Alberta government released a natural gas vision and strategy, and part of that was a hydrogen component um, uh, and key commitments to helping grow the province's blue hydrogen capabilities. Uh, how do you think that fits with the national strategy, and, and what is ATCO? up to to uh, help Alberta achieve its aspirations. Yeah, uh, thanks Dale and and thanks to all the attendees that I can't see and I know are all around the world. I, they can probably see I'm in a vehicle and I hope that <laughs> that doesn't dampen my credibility, but uh, I'm, uh, I had to be out in the field today and I apologize if, if, if anyone's taken aback by that, but is, great is question. It a hot is it a hydrogen vehicle? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. And and I mean this this goes back to David's point about go big or go home. Like, um, let's be blunt about Alberta right now. Like, there's not a there isn't one hydrogen refueling station in Alberta. Let's just be honest about it. We've got work to do um, when it comes to building infrastructure here. Um, 
however, like, let me go back to, to your question. And um, there, the Alberta, the natural gas vision and strategy for Alberta was a great first step in, in identifying the opportunity for um, a number of areas of growth to support, you know, our energy market and, and our future markets and, and maintaining the customers we have as well as build, finding new ones. And specifically around hydrogen, um, the government, you know, made some comments in that document around supporting the emerging, I will call it, um, industry around the transportation pieces as well as is in uh, replacement of space heat. Mm -hmm. And but they they've also committed to doing much more. And, and as David would know as well, and he can comment on they've been working on a much broader vision um, that I, I think is still they're still working on. Uh, we it's not been released publicly. So if you Google it, you won't find anything. But they they've been engaging as far as I can tell with pretty much every business or every type of industry that can or, or should use hydrogen. So people like David, uh, organizations like ATCO, as well as the transportation and, and industrial sectors of our economy and going, you know, what, what do you need? What does this look like for you? And I think they're working on trying to find some really um, actionable uh, policies and, and actionable Obje some objectives that they can work towards um, over the next, let's say, five to 10 years here in Alberta. And specifically, I mean, the one thing that's in the strategy right now that is there today is some a real focus on supporting and, and I will even say subsidizing carbon capture and storage. They're, they really want to see that get going. And to, to build on David's comment, and when I say get going, I should be fair, we have significant carbon capture and storage infrastructure in Alberta already. Um, we have the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. We have the Shell Quest project. You know, you put those two pieces of infrastructure together, you have a, somewhere between 50 and 20 megatons a year of, of carbon capture and storage capacity just in those pipes. Uh, and then obviously the, the reservoirs they use have significantly more than that. Um, and so it's really building on that, but also taking hydrogen beyond what it is today, which it's a, it's a chemical used generally in, in, in industry. That, that's it. And most of it's great, to your point earlier, Dale. So how do we, how do we make hydrogen hubs, which is what, what David really works on, and to make this viable beyond, it, it, it can't just be pet projects and projects that are subsidized from government. Like, how do we make this a viable business in those industries like that use transportation fuels or use heating fuels or generate power um, far beyond how the molecules use today? And I think that's the real question. And that's what I spend my days on is what what will that I'm less worried about the technology and more worried about the business models and the policies, um, because that's the real challenge. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the energy hub or the hydrogen hub. Uh, David and the transition accelerator were instrumental. Uh, what was it a a month or two ago, David, in the in the creation of uh, the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, the first such hub in Canada? And uh, Greg, you will be uh, pleased to know if you don't already know that there is in fact a hydrogen refueling station under development at the Edmonton International Airport. Whether you'll be able to use it or not, unless you're driving a 65-ton truck, I don't know, but there you go. It's a start. We have to start somewhere. Might as well start with the big boys and, and see how they make out with it. Um, but anyway, David, getting back to the, to the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, can you tell us uh, the genesis of that? Uh, whose bright idea was this anyway? And uh, what, how is it going to help Alberta? How is it going to help Canada? And how is it going to tap into what some have said is a hundred billion dollar a year hydrogen industry in Canada and, and trillions yeah. globally? Well, I think one of the things when you start looking at hydrogen, we know that we can make it pretty low cost, uh, especially compared to other nations. The challenge is, is moving it around and getting it from supply to demand. 
and to have a reliable system that is, as Greg says, is economically viable. So that's really about creating a new value chain. So it was pretty clear that you needed to think about the entire value chain. And like any chain, it's only as good as its weakest link. And so what we had to look at is, is uh, how are we going to use hydrogen? We can, hydrogen can go into um, and used for space heating, it can be used for industrial uses, in many ways, used for many things that we now use natural gas for, and hydrogen, uh, and also what we can do is put in, um, uh, hydrogen could be uh, used for transportation, for, for, for vehicle transportation. So one of the things that really requires is to do it in one location around a hub. So about three or four years ago, we were in, uh, you know, we were looking at it and saying, look at in this, uh, the concept of getting to net zero requires that we really need to focus on concentrated areas to build uh, economically viable capacity. And, uh, and we identified Edmonton as probably the most promising place in Canada to get started because the that region near the industrial heartland already makes over 2000 tons of hydrogen a day. And uh, and so we could piggyback a new fuel hydrogen economy off an existing industrial feedstock hydrogen economy. And so we started to check the ideas out. We started talking to a lot of companies. We started talking to levels, different levels of government, uh, municipal, uh, provincial, federal government. And it's rare that you actually get an alignment and have a shared vision for, all oh, right, yeah, this makes some sense. And so, the three levels of government came together uh, about uh, we you know really in, in earnest about a year ago, and then in, in we started talking a lot more, and then the hub was uh, launched a few two months ago uh, to to actually grow out a hydrogen economy, and it it ties into a lot of the work say Greg was doing. Greg was instrumental with Atco in getting. Uh, the Saskatchewan hydrogen blending project going. It's it's in the same region. We had started a project about three years ago to put heavy duty hydrogen trucks on the road. This is the Aztec project you talked about. Uh, the fueling station for that Aztec project was originally going to be at the Edmonton airport. Uh, we now have it, it's gonna be at the uh, associated with Suncor. Oh, course, right, and so it's at the Suncor plant. I knew that too, Suncor. I knew yeah. that. Yeah. Now we're hoping to have another one at the Edmonton Airport. So okay, we are still. So we're hoping uh, within a couple of years to create it in order to target the heavy trucks moving between Calgary and Edmonton. So a lot of what we've been doing is saying, where's the low hanging fruit? We know we can make hydrogen. Um, we know how to move it around. There's different ways of moving around. You can press it and put it on a truck. You can liquefy it, cryogenically drop the temperature to 252 degrees Celsius below zero, right? And then it becomes a liquid and you can move it around as a liquid. That's, uh, that, you know, that's got some real benefits. Uh, the ideal way, if we get the scale, is pipelines, is to move the hydrogen around in, in pipelines, or pure hydrogen pipelines, and then bring it out and use it. It, it fits nicely in the kind of work that ATCO is trying to do is to put it into natural gas systems as a blend, uh, but it also uh, works well for fueling stations and one could start to look at uh, combined heat and power systems and even power generation uh, pipelines. And hydrogen and pipelines is how we need to export hydrogen to other jurisdictions across Canada, um, you know, and, and even overseas. Um, so bring it to the to the west coast, maybe convert it to ammonia and export it from the west coast. Those are all, um, you know, part the the whole infrastructure is a really part, and getting to scale uh, is a really important part of the system. But in order to start that, we have to do it. We have to get the scale in one region. So we've been focusing a lot on what we can do in the Edmonton region because we have the hydrogen supply there. We got a, a number of pipelines that are. Uh, this underused or discontinued use. There used to be natural gas pipelines. They can be refurbished, made into hydrogen pipelines. We've got a really engaged uh, transportation sector. The Alberta Motor Transport Association is is very much engaged in in um, the idea of hydrogen trucking. Uh, the Edmonton and the Strathcona transit fleets. Uh, we're working with them to try to put hydrogen buses on the roads in the Edmonton and Strathcona areas 
to to create a demand uh, of and a low carbon, uh, uh, you know, a public transit system. And the fact that they're so close to the supply, uh, you know, the economics works and the payback time is uh, is reasonable. So, so we're we're trying to get it started, demonstrate it here, and then grow like a spider web out along major transportation corridors. And and perhaps not coincidentally, I think some of those same uh, benefits or uh, components that you mentioned are uh, are behind uh, utility efforts to uh, bring hydrogen into their their grids. And and Atco Greg has kind of jumped out and and taking a a very large lead in in the development of of this in Western Canada. Could you talk to us about where you've uh, come in at the on the hydrogen uh, landscape and what what your your initial efforts in Alberta are? Sure. And maybe, so it, maybe what some of your future efforts might be, might future plans might be as well. Sure. Yeah. So um, what I'll do is start by saying if if anyone just Google's Atco Hydrogen, we have a little website and you can see the projects we've completed, the projects we're working on, and and there's some other FAQs and information there. If if because I won't be able to touch on everything just in the interest of time, mm -hmm. but. We, we got going in Australia a few years ago, and that was a great first project for us to really understand, you know, is this for real? Can we do this? Can we blend hydrogen into a gas system? And very quickly, what we learned from an Alberta standpoint was not only is, you know, making hydrogen from natural gas is the obvious way to do it here um, for a whole bunch of reasons I won't get into on the call, but it's just, it's cheaper and it's scalable. I'll leave it there. Um, and it can be just as low carbon as creating it via electrolysis. Um, secondly, when we look at, you know, the our customer base in Alberta and, and our economy and we go, okay, what are people asking for? What are the policies and, and the objectives of, you know, a, a multitude of organizations and, and individuals? And what we're seeing is, a large focus on, I won't use the word net zero, but really on, on lowering the carbon emissions of, of our largest industries, as well as just how we do business every day. And we think that pipelines have a role to play in that. Um, when you look in Alberta specifically, and I'll just use some numbers to, to help explain the size of this challenge. Um, our pipeline network on a peak day delivers between five and 10 times what the electricity grid can deliver in Alberta. We're not even the largest pipeline network in, in Alberta, okay? Like TC Energy has, has more natural gas pipes than we do. Um, and even when you look annually, the numbers are just staggering. And so if we're really serious, as a, as a, this is as a society, this is not ATCO or TC Energy or Dave Lizell, it's as a society, if we're really serious about decarbonization and, and doing the best we can within our means, I mean, we already have a battery to store low carbon energy and it's called our pipes. And many of those pipes can be reused in a hydrogen network, not all of them, but many can, we're gonna need new ones. And on top of it, when you look at a more macro level um, for our economy, we export a lot of energy. And, and David's done some great work through Caesar um, that explains, you know, just in, in liquid energy, what we export. And if we see countries or, or regions like the United States and Europe and Asia start to transition, if we're not part of that transition and we're not showing people that we can do it here and we can create that energy, um, you know, at, at a competitive price and um, just as, as reliably as other regions, um, there's a good chance we get left behind. So, not only is it in our economic interest to do this, but it's in our like environmental and sustainable um, uh, interests as well. And and I think that's really where, where our organization lands is we think we can be an enabler, but we can also help our customers. Um, the final piece I will add to this, because we haven't got into the details on cost, and this is a Canadian specific point, but when you look at the trajectory of carbon taxation on gaseous fuels out to 2030, you're, you're going to have a, a, a natural gas molecule with $170 a ton carbon tax in 2030 is about a $10 a gigajoule molecule or $10 a decatherm. 
for the Americans on the call. Um, you can make blue hydrogen for $10 a gigajoule. And I see David nodding. Like it, it can actually be competitive on price. And you'll say, well, that's all if there's a carbon tax. I'm pretty <laughs> confident there's going to be a carbon tax in yeah. Canada. Get used you know, to we, it, folks. <laughs> yeah, get used yeah. to it, folks. Like maybe in other jurisdictions, there may not be. But I would say in the European Union, in the United Kingdom, in Canada, even in parts of Asia, we're going to have those, those, you know, and there's even talk in Ottawa about a carbon adjustment border tax, even like there's, I don't see this going away. So it makes sense for us to start now and, and really get the costs figured out, make sure that what I'm saying is not hogwash and we can prove it with real projects at scale. And um, that's really where our head is at as an organization. So we're, we're trying to lead in that, that area and also help other organizations do what they want to do. A, a couple of questions come to mind just listening to what you had to say. And and uh, just for our audience out there, please take advantage of the opportunity to, to ask uh, David and Greg some questions. Use the question uh, panel at the bottom of the of the screen to post your questions and we'll get to those in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes to close out the session. But a couple uh, come to mind just listening to Greg is you mentioned that that some but not all of the existing pipeline infrastructure is amenable to hydrogen. What what is the extent of uh, refurbishment refurbishment that might be required to make more of the infrastructure amenable to hydrogen given its lower energy density? Sure. Uh, and is that is that feasible, or would it be would it be cheaper to just put all new pipe in the ground? So this is a great question, and I'm going to break it up into three parts. I'm going to talk about the distribution system, the transmission system, and then our customers, because it actually the issue is not necessarily a, a materials only issue, and one it, it's really about operational challenges as well as security of supply. So if we were to just go blend into our distribution system today, and so that means pipes that are 100 pounds or less, 100, you know, 550 kPa or less, we in general will not have issues with those pipes. There are exceptions, but in general, those pipes will work. When you get into the transmission system, it's a completely different answer. And what I will say is you have to look at every asset individually and if you have things like compression on those systems or you have a gas plant pulling gas like in Alberta off of that line, there are all sorts of potential complications on the transmission system. So what we've presented publicly is we believe likely you're going to need new transmission lines for pure hydrogen. Why we say that, it's not that you can't put hydrogen into those many of those existing transmission lines, but you're going to impact customers who rely in some cases on the methane molecule, like they don't want hydrogen or they can't take it. Like if I have a power plant or a gas plant that's very sensitive to heating value, those are generally coming straight off the transmission system. And I think that in order to not disrupt our industrials in Alberta in a way that could be extremely expensive or, or cause a lot of operational issues for them. It's much more prudent to, to build a, a system with pure hydrogen in it um, to start at least. Um, and so what I wanna say is, can you on transmission lines? Yes, to some extent you can put hydrogen in them. Some you cannot. By the way, I don't want to make it sound completely like it's 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 easy and, and it can be done, but it doesn't actually make sense to do it in a lot of cases. It makes more sense to build some new infrastructure around the province that can also back pin things or, or you know, anchor things like tra uh, transportation because they don't want a blend of hydrogen and natural gas. They need pure hydrogen. So that is that is our view on this topic. Okay. Um, now, circling back to something that, that David mentioned it, is the export opportunities um, for hydrogen. You said that there was a, uh, you, you have to chill chill hydrogen to get it into liquid form. Are we talking something on the scale 
of an LNG facility or is it uh, something a little bit easier and, and more bite-sized than, than the multi tens of billions of dollars that go into a say an LNG Canada project on the West Coast? Like, is this doable and can Canada for once take a lead on getting to export markets for hydrogen? I think the initially now liquefied hydrogen is more seen as a way of uh, producing um, hydrogen that can be transported more for domestic use for as a transportation fuel. So in other words, um, companies that uh, might make blue hydrogen centrally would put a 10 or 20, 30 ton a day liquid hydrogen facility. And then that allows them to truck, say each truck load can take four tons of liquid hydrogen to a fueling station where the hydrogen is then um, converted from as liquid, liquid state to a compressed gas state at high pressure and basically be fueled into vehicles and uh, is as compressed gas. Typically the large vehicles, the heavy duty trucks are about 350 bars pressure on the tanks. And that's the market for liquid hydrogen in North America today. There is a possibility of bringing a pipeline to the West Coast for export. So take the pipeline to the West Coast and set up a liquefaction plant on the West Coast. You're not gonna, let's say, you're not gonna pipeline liquid hydrogen, right? It's 253, okay. yeah, you're just not gonna be pipelining liquid hydrogen. You can bring gaseous hydrogen to the coast, then put a like a very large LNG type facility, very similar technology, it's just 70 degrees Celsius colder. Uh, so it's, you know, you're, you're dropping another, uh, you know, 70 degrees Celsius off the temperature of, uh, to get it to liquid hydrogen. Um, but the challenge is, is there's a number of studies that have been done as if, because then you want to put the liquid hydrogen on a ship and take it to Japan or to South Korea or to China. Um, Japan and South Korea have both made it very clear they want to import hydrogen. And their South uh, Japan announced back in December they wanted to import by um, 3 million tons of hydrogen per year uh, by uh, 2030. And uh, so we've been doing some calculations saying, well, Canada's share of that could be 1 million tons a year or something in that range, which is, uh, you know, it's a, that's a lot of hydrogen. Now, what is the form that that hydrogen would be imported? You could import it um, as liquid hydrogen. The problem with that is you're gonna need a lot of electricity on the West Coast. There's a shortage of low carbon electricity to to make the to do the cryogenics. Uh, and um, and the fact is is it's quite expensive. Um, what is being looked at now with a lot of analysis is to actually convert that hydrogen to ammonia and export ammonia. And Japan, if you look at Japan's hydrogen strategy, they now, Mitsubishi and a number of the Japanese companies are looking at using the ammonia that they might import from countries like Canada, Australia, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, to, to convert that um, ammonia directly into electricity using gas turbines. And they have ammonia-driven gas turbines now. And um, and they're, they're actually got very big plans to have a very large imports of of ammonia that they would just burn directly to make electricity and to allow them to shift off of nuclear uh, in Japan and to end off of gas. So there's the other possibility, the ammonia could actually be converted back into hydrogen as well. And there are a number of Japanese technologies to do that. And then they can use, the ammonia could feed into um, a transportation fuel as well as into electricity, their electricity grid. The, the scale of the opportunity for Canada is quite large. I worry a bit that we're going to dawdle about doing this and lose the now, market. Why, why, why would that <laughs> cause you so, concern, David? Yes, exactly. You know, so we've, seen, we've seen before a lot of talking, and, and I would argue you know, <laughs> we need to engage we need to engage with First Nations. We need to have more interprovincial cooperation and discussions about uh, you know a pipelining um, putting pipelines across uh, across BC uh, the west coast we need to engage all of the stakeholders and I would argue you know one of the and you know one of the recommendations I would have is get moving on this and I know it's already moving there is a lot of discussions going on we're involved in some of them but the idea is let's have a shared 
a pan-Canadian vision for the role that we can pay, play uh, in in not only providing hydrogen for uh, decarbonizing our own energy system, but we have the potential to provide a lot of hydrogen down to the United States. They needed a lot. They need a lot of hydrogen, California especially, uh, but also uh, to overseas markets. And some of the work I know I get Jeff, uh, Greg to talk about some of the work that he's been doing, looking at sort of east-west grids and other stuff. It'd be pretty neat stuff. Yeah. Okay. I I just like to get one more uh, one more uh, perspective from you on this um, before we get to some questions. Some of which have been answered already in in the discussions, but we'll get to those. Uh, right now, blue hydrogen doesn't really get a lot of love for from the NGOs who are driving the uh, transition conversation. Why? Why is that, and why why is why is blue hydrogen beyond it? It I mean it's half the cost or more of, of than green hydrogen. Why doesn't it get the love, and what can be done to uh, for it to get the attention it needs? And how critical is it to uh, the global aspirations to meet the, the Paris climate targets? Greg, do you want to do, go first? Do you want me to go first? Sure. Yeah, sure. I'm, yeah, I'm happy so, to see I, I mean, I, I very briefly touched on just some of the numbers on, on energy just that we deliver. Um, those numbers ring true for Japan, Germany, South Korea, the United States. Um, if, if we focus on, um, so I'm going to just be blunt here. If we focus on all hydrogen coming from renewable resources and converting you know, converting electricity into hydrogen. Um, there just isn't enough electricity, period. And I'm not saying renewable electricity, just electricity. Any, anything, yeah. to, to To even displace diesel, I don't think. Um, you know, and, and still keep the lights on. Like, it just isn't possible. So you're correct about the cost and you're correct about, um, you know, and it's not to say that I'm not some anti-green hydrogen guy. We did a project using solar and, and making hydrogen, I think it's awesome. But it has its place and it's not anywhere near being a silver bullet because of just the reality of how our world uses energy. Um, I think that many NGOs look at blue hydrogen and they see to your point that it is cheaper than green and that you can store it much cheaper than electricity um, at, at utility scales. and and that it's extremely low carbon and can be done. And they go, this is a lifeline for an industry that we've been fighting for, you know, I, I'm just gonna be blunt for, for 20 to 30 years. And they see that as a negative. Uh, I would say that, that our view at ATCO and I think the view of Canadian Gas Association and, and even many other, I, I cannot speak for other NGOs in Canada, but we've seen it from their publications is if we, the goal is to lower carbon and to clean up, you know, our environments internationally and, and, you know, keep people fed and warm and economically prosperous. It's not to shut down industries. And if blue hydrogen can do that, great. But I think there are some, some, I won't, I don't want to list all NGOs and say they're all against blue hydrogen, but some that ideologically struggle to wrap their head mm -hmm. around that companies like Suncor and Shell and BP could remain I'll, I'll call it fossil fuel companies by capturing the carbon, but still producing fossil fuels. I think they struggle with that. Um, what I would say is if we can do that, that's awesome because we'll be able to keep energy relatively affordable and, and people around the world will benefit from that. Because the worst thing we could do is, you know, quadruple the price of energy on everyone on this planet. That The outcome won't be good if we do that. And that's why I said earlier, like, I agree with David, we have to go big on these projects or else the cost will be too high. So I, I hope that answers the question from my end. Dave might have another view. No, I, I, I don't have another view, but just to extend it, I think one of the things that we, that the energy companies need to do in this space is to actually build some really significant demonstration projects and that are open and transparent about the carbon intensity. Um, our, we've done a lot of techno-economic analysis of the various um, ways of getting to 
low cost hydrogen, both green and blue. And uh, the one that seems to me the most attractive is autothermal reforming, um, where you're basically uh, essentially converting the methane uh, natural gas molecule to hydrogen in pure CO2 stream. You're creating two streams, a pure CO2 and a pure hydrogen, sequester the CO2. You can get about a 95% uh, reduction in carbon emissions compared to gray hydrogen. And that brings the carbon intensity of hydrogen down to comparable to, uh, well, lower than solar energy by quite a bit. Uh, when you look at the life cycle, uh, probably comparable to wind. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, in, in the range of, say, um, large hydro, sort of in even lower than large hydro. And so at that, and that's the whole life cycle, you know, that's looking at the entire life cycle from pulling the natural gas out. I think the opportunity to lower it even further, and this is going to be really important, the is there has to be some real movement on on reducing the methane emissions that come from extracting natural gas there has to be more of a focus on the upstream emissions because when you actually do autothermal reforming about 80 um, percent of the remaining emissions are actually on the upstream right mm -hmm. and the the emissions that you get from actually processing the natural gas and making hydrogen out of it you know are actually so low that most of your emissions are actually associated with the upstream. So, uh, so I think there's going to be a lot more pressure on 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 the reducing those emissions. But the reality is, the studies that I've seen, is they're probably the lowest cost emissions to reduce. Right? To reduce, they're yeah, yeah. They're, and, we can, and, lot, and, and I think the companies can do a lot better. And a, and a lot has been done. I mean, uh, Shell has has virtually entirely electrified their their ground birch field, which is supplying yes. their component or their portion of the LNG Canada feed yep. gas. And I know Tourmaline is making a lot of yep. efforts to uh, reduce emissions. And that, again, will be part of another focus of our uh, yep. gas dialogues discussion in September is is methane, first of all, measurement. If you can't, you can't abate it if you yep. can't measure it. Yep. Uh, identification of technologies. Yep to both identify it and mitigate it and, and policies at both the federal level and the provincial level that support that. Uh, okay, we've got uh, about 11 minutes left and I've got a whole list of questions here. Uh, some of them I believe have been answered. Uh, first of all, I guess for either one of you, uh, what are your thoughts on electric vehicles versus hydrogen vehicles? Uh, this viewer's understanding is that hydrogen vehicles can't compete with EVs either uh, on a on a plug-in or a hybrid basis. Can I can I take that one, yeah. Dave? Sure. And then you, you can you can fix whatever I get wrong because he's he's the PhD. I'm just a lowly engineer. Um, yeah. So they both have a place um hydrogen vehicles are electric vehicles they just don't have a really big heavy battery that you carry along with them um i'm sitting at a truck stop right now like you most of you can't see it um, but i can tell you these trucks that have just gone through a mountain pass here in alberta most of them coming from the lower mainland of british columbia i mean just the engineer and the the basic physics that i understand um when you can do that on a on a single charge or even on two charges and still carry the payload, like I'll I'll, I'll say there's no place for hydrogen, but I just don't see it. The phys, like the physics don't the physics lie about don't this work, one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and I think there's a real place for hydrogen. Now, for me, do I need a hydrogen vehicle? Probably not. I, I think EVs are totally gonna win in the the personal passenger space, except for the people that like in Alberta big diesel trucks for towing trailers to go camping to go snowmobiling those people i i don't see them going electric and so i think it comes down to use case it's not one works or the other doesn't it's how do you use your vehicles and for the vast majority of people electric will work but i'll hand it off to dave because he's done a lot here as well no i agree with everything you said i would say for personally owned vehicles that we drive maybe 15 20 000 kilometers a year it doesn't make sense to go hydrogen. A, it creates a real problem because you got to have a lot more fueling stations, mm -hmm. and and the and the cost of hydrogen is not just the cost of the vehicle; it's actually the cost of the infrastructure to support those vehicles. Mm -hmm. Our focus has been 
um, on targeting hydrogen to industrial parts of cities where the heavy trucks are, the bus fleets, return to base operations. Those happen to be along the industrial corridors. We're not suggesting putting hydrogen at a fueling station uh, for personal vehicles. So I just, if you know, if there are going to be used on smaller vehicles, it's probably going to be used with taxi fleets or delivery vehicles, right? That are basically where it makes sense is when you've got a vehicle every day is driving 300 kilometers, 500 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers a day. That makes sense for hydrogen. And that's where you get the benefit. I would say go electric, battery electric, uh, if you can. But there's a lot of times you can't. And that's where hydrogen fits in. And that's, in, in my mind, that's the, that's the niche that we're do, working on to support uh, hydrogen. And it turns out those corridors are the same corridors in most cities where you have the gates for moving from uh, transmission to distribution pipelines for natural gas. And so there's a nice alignment there. And, and we have a lot of big industrial buildings that might do power generation, right? So and my sense is be smart. Let's, and it, you know. And in a lot of cases, they're even where the railways are. And I mean, when, the I rail talk, exactly. when you talk about, um, you know, the, the low hanging fruit, I mean, Dave said earlier, we can make hydrogen cheaper than diesel. The railways in Canada alone use billions yeah. with an S liter of diesel every year. That's probably in how, how many places do you need to put refueling for railways versus transportation? I mean, th this is where you have to use it, the cost benefit there. It's going to be much, much more significant than, you know, passenger vehicles. Are, are there, are there, Rail carriers cognizant of all this is there. I've seen some references to hydrogen used in in the rail industry in Europe, but uh, the rail well, industry CP, in Europe is a far different animal than it is here. But well, actually, if you in December 20th of last year, and again in April, March, or I guess or April this year, uh, Canadian Pacific announced that uh, they're already taken their diesel electric. One of their diesel electric shunter or switcher trains, and they're converting it to hydrogen fuel cell electric. And they will have it on the tracks in Alberta uh, by January, or February next year for trials. And uh, it's quite exciting what they're doing. And uh, and they see the opportunity to put, uh, you know, essentially the train sector in North America on a on a track. And you know, it's really interesting. The, what we've learned in some of the work that we've been doing within the transition accelerator is what is the uh, the nice thing about hydrogen when you go and replace diesel fuel that it, depending on your drive cycle um, you can get so that one gigajoule of hydrogen replaces up to two gigajoules even more of diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. So not only do you can you get get a zero carbon fuel, uh, but you can actually get more um, transportation. Value efficiency, with you, right? out of, yeah. efficiency out of it because you're you know if you've got a lot of vehicles that idle a lot like city buses where they're slowing up and picking up speed um with the nice thing is you get regenerative braking but you also get you when the when the vehicle's idling a fuel cell just turns off because it also has batteries on board yeah. and so the the fuel cells basically charging a stack of batteries and the batteries can get the vehicle started, the fuel cell can start up and then recharge again. So it's just recharging on the go. It's like a range extender, if you like, in many cases. Mm -hmm. So though, though that really creates a, a tremendous advantage for the, the freight sector uh, and also um, the passenger trains. Okay. Good. Uh, next question, a lot of discussion about ammonia. Okay, we covered that one, uh, ammonia as a hydrogen carrier. Uh, here's one for Greg. Uh, why a 5% hydrogen mix with natural gas? Uh, sure. What impact does this have on the combustion process? And I guess a corollary to that is, is a higher concentration of hydrogen necessarily better? So if your goal is emission reduction, the, the higher concentration, the better the emission reduction. Okay. And it's not linear. So, um, you know, I... Uh, it's not a straight line and, and I'll just leave it there on, on the blending. Why 5% in Fort Saskatchewan? We wanted a project that would come without any 
safety or technical end use impact to customers, but also not terrify customers that are unsure or who Google something and, and go, oh, that's way higher than anyone's ever done. And or also get a, our, our re- go or ahead, get a picture of the or get a picture of the Hindenburg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we we view five percent as a starting point, not an ending point. Um, what I'll add to that for us is that we don't currently have the regulatory authority to blend hydrogen. So we didn't want to, you know, say, hey, we're starting with 20 percent or we're starting with some some quite high number. Um, what I will say is our our hope is that I mean, I, I made a comment earlier that we think hydrogen will be cost competitive with natural gas by the end of the decade. I mean, what where we'd like to get is is ideally having a pure hydrogen community in the not too near future to really demonstrate that that's kind of the end point. Blending is just a way to get there because it's completely unpractical for me to come here and say, oh, we're just going to take our 1.2 million customers and make them all hydrogen make by 2050. Yeah. I think I think there's a lot of hoops to jump through for that. What we need to look at is how do we build new communities and what can we do to existing communities to not impact their appliances, how they, you know, basically you turn on the heat, you don't notice. And Mm -hmm. the answer is there isn't, there isn't like, oh, you can only go to 20% or 15%. It depends on a number of factors from the Wabi index of appliances to the heat value of the gas you're starting with to elevation even like there's a bunch of factors that impact that number but at five we know we could successfully execute the project educate customers educate the regulator and the government and then build from there that was the intent of five and e- and even the grade of steel used in your pipes is uh, determinant or or not on, is an indication of, of what level of hydrogen it can handle I, without. I will say the grade of steel, even in the Fort Saskatchewan network, we're quite confident we could run pure hydrogen yeah. in that network. We haven't yeah. proven that out yet, but we're quite confident based on it's a you know it's a low strength steel run at low pressure. Uh, the the issue is not the pipes. If we yeah. want to go to pure hydrogen, the issue is going to be end use. Okay. Uh, here's one from David. Uh, can you comment on the potential on the East Coast? There's been talk in Newfoundland about using hydro, hydro from Labrador to produce hydrogen. Yeah, no, that's actually, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be, if you have to pay a uh, high price for the electricity, it will be an expense of hydrogen. But if there's, if you're looking at moving a lot of energy over long distances, and Greg alluded to this a bit, you're talking about large amounts of energy moving long distances, and obviously there's a long distance between Labrador and market. Um, it's about, you know, to move, for example, a thousand kilometers of electricity is uh, about five cents a kilowatt hour, for example, for moving electricity. If you did it, you know, just converted, um, you know, for, uh, moving hydrogen, you could probably move it for a fifth to, or, you know, one fifth to one tenth the cost. Uh, per per kilowatt hour, so it'd be half a cent uh, per kilowatt hour than kilowatt hour of hydrogen, and I think that there's um, there is a possibility that actually it might you know I think certainly we've been encouraging and in, in talking to uh, some of it is that how what are you wanting to use with that electricity? If there's obviously if you want the electricity as electricity as end site, then um, you know move it in, move it through wires but if you're thinking about at you know moving the electricity 500 or 1000 kilometers and then electrolyzing it and converting it to hydrogen i'd say make it hydrogen and at the at the big hydro dam and pipeline the 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 hydrogen and i think that i think you'd find the economics is better um you know and it's also um you know you, the maintenance costs of course in maintaining the wires versus maintaining a pipeline uh, have some benefits as well. So, so I'm, um, I think in terms of um, the East Coast, uh, there's a lot of wind, both offshore wind and onshore wind potential in, in Nova Scotia, for example, and in, in Newfoundland that that could be um, that could actually be producing not only greener electricity for the grid, but when the price of electricity is high, you want to put it on the grid. 
when you're oversupplying, you got enough wind and solar, for example, or even um, hydro that there's, you're oversupplying the grid needs, make it into hydrogen and, and start supplying your transportation needs and space heating and, and other other things and I think there's uh, I think there's some significant changes we're going to see in the structure of our energy systems when we stop thinking in silos that we're an electricity company we're a heating company we're a transportation fuel company that's kind of the way our energy system works today I think in the next 30 years we're going to find companies more and more thinking of themselves as energy companies and recognizing that there's an incredible synergy between electricity and hydrogen and hydrogen electricity and you can actually depending on supply and demand we could have a more integrated energy system than the than the one we have today and i think when you start thinking that way uh, the opportunities in eastern canada become quite exciting because uh, they'll tell you right now they pay uh, in nova scotia pays what a lot more for natural gas <laughs> than we do in alberta Right, and um, you, know, you throw in carbon taxes on top of that, and uh, you know, so and I think there's going to be an opportunity for some restructuring of our energy systems, different parts of Canada. And 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 I know we're tight on time, Dale, but uh, just to add to that, I, I made the comment about you know we have this battery system already. It's called pipelines, and mm -hmm. and the, and if we truly do, and I, I'm I'm not the electricity expert, so I'll just you know keep my comment short here but if we truly do want to go to an intermittent intermittent renewable network of wind solar hydro um you could it it's practically feasible in some areas uh, if you can store hydrogen for when those those wind when when windmills and solar panels aren't working i'm not going to say it's economic i see there's some challenges there but if you really want to go past i mean most networks fail to get past 30% wind and solar for obvious reasons, it's just too intermittent. Um, you end up with a lot of challenges without base load back up this natural gas. Um, so if, if we wanna do that and, and not use natural gas and not emit carbon when we combust the gas for generating electricity, there's a way to do it. Um, but so I just think whatever, whatever the right solution is, I, I, I'm not trying to solution here, but whatever it is, building out hydrogen networks now will help us get there. I think we're gonna need the gaseous fuel no matter what. Okay. Uh, David, any last thoughts from you? No, I just say amen. <laughs> you know, I agree with amen. I agree with what uh, what Greg just says. I think it's, you know, there, there's some really um, off-grid communities. I think there's a much more of a possibility of of, of integrating our, our chemical energy and electrical energy systems. And I think there's uh, some exciting projects uh, being developed there. So, and maybe they will, they will become more centralized as they can scale up, but. Excellent. No. So, great. Thank okay. You. We have run past our time. Um, I'd like to thank both of you for taking time out from your schedules, David, uh, you and your home office and Greg heading to somewhere more pleasant than anywhere close to where David and I are at right now. Um, I'd like to thank you both for taking that time. I'd like to thank our, our viewers for taking an hour out of your schedule this morning and this afternoon. I'd like to uh, beg your indulgence for another 30 seconds uh, before we leave as we uh, view a quick video from Bayotech, our sponsors, and also remind our viewers that uh, as part of uh, registering for this webinar, uh, we've given you uh, premium access to our new gas and transmissions uh, monthly magazine, the most recent edition of which is available in the handout section uh, of your dashboard. With that, I'd like to thank you again. We'll see you in September at Canadian Gas Dialogues, and please stay tuned to this space for the next edition of our Canadian Gas Dialogues webinar series. And Dale, can I say one thing? Uh, yep. If anyone had a question we didn't get to, send me Certainly. a question on LinkedIn or email me. I just, I know we never, I, I, I hate not getting to them, but it's how these always work. So. Yeah, there's there's a few that weren't uh, answered. I, I will uh, condense those and, and get them to you. Uh, hopefully we have the uh, person contact information for the people who ask those questions. Find, so, find me on LinkedIn for those people. Right.
Thanks yep, very much, you. Greg. Thanks, Dr. David. Thank you. And now, Biotech. Thank you.